Technology and the Future of Medicine, the course I took with Dr. Solez, was uh, a very eye-opening experience for me. The reason that I took this course was to broaden my view on, on technology and the future of medicine. I mean, the title is perfect. We, we discuss how nanotechnology is enabling new ways of finding medicines by uh, synthesizing proteins and protein folding. We learned how new tools like medical diagnostic imaging and, uh, and applications that doctors can carry around in their pockets to learn new surgical techniques, how those influence medicine. So I, I think the real benefit for this course uh, can be applied broadly. Whether you're an undergraduate or a graduate student, the real reason that you would come to a course like this is to learn about what you're not learning about in your other courses. The courses that are saying, this is how to do nanotechnology. This is how to do a particular kind of medicine. Whereas this course is really a more broad and far-reaching course that says, this is how technology will be done. This is how medicine will be done. And the topics are very broad and they're accessible to everybody. So whether or not you're a computer scientist, when we talk about things like the promise and perils of AI, how artificial intelligence is developing and how that affects our lives, it's a very accessible way to, to get into that subject and to learn about the ethics of creating artificially intelligent computers or creating computers that replace humans in, in, in fields where humans are the only ones capable of doing that job. So we're talking about training neural nets and, and whether artificial intelligences will be malicious in the future and how we protect ourselves against that or whether or not our bodies will be fused with those technologies and whether we will become the, the very machines that we fear becoming or fear that will destroy us, I suppose. So one of the reasons I started coming to this course is because of my fearfulness really about the future and how fast things are progressing because we're still in the year 2012 seeing advances in computing technology that double almost every 18 months and the ramifications of those are not clear especially now that you know we've computers are basically ubiquitous in our lives they keep track of our calendars they keep track of our social interactions with friends uh, they control traffic lights. So what happens when computing technology, you know, 10 years from now, allows a computer to have an intelligent conversation with a human? What happens when that computer is making decisions on behalf of humans? Uh, and so the fear that I have really drives not from science fiction where machines are killing humans or, or enslaving them to generate electricity, but the fear that I'm not going to be able to understand those things, that I'm somehow not going to be capable of discerning the, uh, the intric intricacies of those technologies. And so this kind of, this kind of education, this forward-looking education that doesn't look at the here and the now, but looks into the future, I think is very important. Not only does it reassure me that I'm learning something that's useful for the future, but that somehow I'm going to be able to remain in control of that future, that I'm going to be able to make decisions based on whether or not I want cybernetic implants or whether or not I want to adopt nanotechnology as a medicine where you know, I'm basically putting, putting man-made creations in my body that have a task to do and if they do the task incorrectly, they could somehow kill me, right? I really think that the benefits of this course are individual and that everybody will have their own their own reason for coming and they'll all learn something different by attending and the reason for that is that the subject matter that we cover in this course is so diverse that you talk about artificial intelligence from a computer science perspective you talk about solving games with the Dean of Science Dr. Schaefer you talk about medical ethics with Earl Waugh you talk about uh, the future of medicine from the, the point of view of a surgeon, Jonathan White. And all of these different viewpoints, they all are pointing to the same thing, that there's something in every subject that we talk about that is accelerating rapidly, that's changing rapidly, and that the only way to really 
steel yourself against catastrophe is by learning about it. So this is one of the few courses in the university that doesn't say, you must learn this. So everybody's experience in this course is going to be different, and everybody's going to learn something that they didn't learn before. But the crucial part is that you're learning things that future-proof yourself, that you're not just learning something that will maybe become obsolete in the next 10 years as, uh, you know, maybe computers get better at writing computer programs than the computer scientists do. So what are the computer scientists to do in a situation where the material that they learned in their career is obsolete? Well, this course is a really good eye-opener in a sense that it, it tells us, you know, at face value that the world is changing and it's changing so rapidly that the only real way to protect yourself is to learn and like James Hughes said, stay healthy. That, that the future is going to be so vastly different and this is the only course that tells you that. It's the only course that instead of gazing at its navel, looks out into the world and says, Look at how far we've come in the last 100 years in terms of medicine, in terms of computing. And look at how far we have to go in the next 100 years. So I really benefited from this course because I was exposed to all these different speakers, all these different topics. And before this, I thought of the Singularity as a bit of a niche club where people would discuss uh, becoming cyborgs or, you know, extending their lifespan past the point of, uh, of what we call the, the medical singularity. And that's really not what the course was about. I mean, in a sense it was because we talked about the ethics of humans me uh, being melded with machines. And we talked a little bit about uh, extending our lifespan through genetic modification. But really the course was specific to those subjects. How far have we come in the last 10 years in genomics alone, right? We've, uh, we've looked at the entire human genome in the last 10 years and the, the price is diminishing. So does it make sense for me as a person to, to get my own genome sequence, to figure out whether later in life I'm going to have these genetic diseases? And being exposed to that in and of itself really give, gave me a completely different perspective on, on what I'm doing today. Now, rather than saying, okay, what's the, next, uh, what's the next big hurdle in my life? I'm looking out decades and saying, how am I going to deal with uh, the day when computer intelligences exceed human intelligences? Uh, you know, we talk about friendships with human beings. Well, is there going to be a computer system that we have friends with? And we're already seeing emerging technologies that are just like that. So holding a conversation with uh, the personal assistant Siri on your iPhone or, you know, any other service like that, chatting with Cleverbot on the internet. And uh, at, one, at what point are, are, is even education going to become obsolete? We talked about the website Udacity. We talked about the website Coursera. We talked about the website Khan Academy. And these are all websites that have university-grade course material that you can go and learn on your own. So being exposed to that is, it's, it's like opening a door, right? There's the only real way that we're going to feel comfortable in the future is if we stay up to date, if we continue to learn these things. And, uh, and that was what I took the most from this course, is that I have to continuously learn. And that's the reason why I'm going to be coming back next year, right? I expect that we'll have many of the same speakers and many different ones, but their course material is going to change. It might be completely new next year. It might be completely different than it is this year. And it might be because of a new medical discovery or a new breakthrough in computer intelligence or a new breakthrough in nanotechnology. And the thing is that I just don't know what those things are. So having this diverse pool of knowledge that I can collect this information from allows me to make informed decisions about how to spend my time, what the next thing for me to learn is you know, and on and on like that. So one of my favorite speakers was Abdullah Salah, who came and talked to us about global citizenship in the context of these developing technologies and developing medicines. And he's part of a, a number of companies that are working in Africa to improve the quality of life there 
using technologies that have been developed in, in, in Canada and the US. But the context that he talks about it is not in helping them, but in teaching them how to use these technologies themselves. And with the emergence of technologies like cell phone networks, the people that live in countries where uh, the roads are bad and, and the driving conditions are bad and the, and the number of hours that it takes to get to a hospital for medical attention is, is, is very high, that these enabling technologies, even though we think of them as old technologies, they're really changing the way that people work in other countries. So uh, we talked a little bit about one of the projects called the Kenya Ceramics Project, which uh, makes ceramic filters for water. And, and it's a totally passive system. The ceramic basically works as a filter that eliminates almost night, what is it, 99% of the, of the bacteria within it within the water and in a passive system. So there's no electricity required. But on top of that, we talked about uh, horizontal versus vertical technology developments. And this is an example of horizontal technology development. They went in to Kenya and they taught the people there how to build these ceramic filters. And one of the most fascinating parts of his lecture was discussing how an economy developed around it, how different people pooled their money to buy filters for each other and did it as sort of a, as a, as a money, as a microfinancing within their own, within their own villages and within their own social networks in areas that, you know, the word social network would never even be used. But I think that's the way that technology is, is changing lives is that rather than trying to help people, we need to try and teach people. We need to try and disseminate technology in a way that is useful, that maximizes its utility for everybody. And that was, I mean, that's one of the most valuable portions of this course because the people that are coming to lecture at the course, they're not, they're not talking about their particular research or not in any depth, but they're talking about how that kind of research impacts everybody, how it impacts uh, people living in North America, people living in Africa, people living in, in Asia, and the benefit that it's having in almost a passive way, right? Once you've set up this, these projects, once you've taught the people how to use uh, cell phone networks to get to seek proper medical attention, they, they take off. And especially in, in situations where there is a need for that, but there's just no infrastructure to support it. And teaching them how to build the infrastructure to do that is really the way to solve it. And it's not providing them with in infrastructure, but, but teaching them how to, how to put it together. It's really fascinating having speakers that are my own age, right? That are mid twenties talking about the projects that they've been on. And so we had Shauna Pandya come in and talk about entrepreneurship and talk about the company that she co-founded, CiviGuard, and, and what her goals in life are really. Because it shows me that there are people in the world who are just, they're hardwired for that kind of work. They're hardwired to, to see a problem and rather than be frustrated by it or, or be angered by it, they, they seek a solution. And sometimes the solution that they find is very simple and, something, and sometimes it's very complicated. But rather than be a passive uh, observer in the process, they actually take that idea and they run with it. Or they pass it off to somebody that they know can run with it. And that, I think the whole idea behind having a good idea and sharing it with people, that was a very important part of the course. That hearing about how projects like the Kenya Ceramics Project actually came into being those are incredibly valuable because you learn not only that it's possible to do something like that and that that in and of itself is valuable but you learn just just how how delicate the balance can be when you're developing a project like that and just how many steps it takes and sometimes what the speaker didn't anticipate right uh, how human interactions work in other countries is especially difficult because we're used to the North American way of life. And 
when we try and apply North American solutions to African problems, we, we, sometimes those solutions aren't the ones that work and sometimes it's innovation that comes from people in Africa for those problems. It's that innovation that leads to the real development. It's that innovation that, that leads to real solutions. So I think the whole idea, uh, a lot of the time, we're talking about networking, whether it's an artificial intelligence network or whether it's a, a network of people or whether it's a network of cell phones, that the solutions to these problems are out there. It's just that the accessibility is high at the moment. So when you strengthen the networks, when you strengthen the relationship between people, when you bring them into a class like this, you generate ideas that wouldn't have emerged organically that they wouldn't have emerged individually. But because we're talking about this in the context of a group and because we have so many different people in the course, we've got you know, students of medicine, we've got undergraduates in, in physics, we've got art students. And when you bring all those people together and you teach them all, this, all these different subjects, you can, you can really see how, the word, I, the word I don't want to use here is synergy, but you can see how there is a synergy between everybody here and that when we discuss these problems, we really come up with creative solutions. And, uh, and I think that that astounded me. That was one of the things in the course that really astounded me. I was astounded by the amount of creativity that can come out of just, you know, often so few students and hopefully more in the future, but, but having a discussion with students after the course and hearing what their interpretation of the speaker's thoughts were that, is in, that was incredible. And I, you know, I've developed friendships in this course that are certainly going to last decades because people who come to this course are all searching for something, I think. that They're, they're all searching for, for what's next, for what's to come. And at the same time, you know, they're preparing for now and, and they're preparing for their future. But this course provides something that other courses don't. And and it's a, it's a little bit magical. It's really hard for me to define. But, but it comes from being exposed to all these different ideas in a way that is completely rational, too. I mean, we're not talking about the Terminator-style uh, destruction of the world. We're not talking about the matrix enslaving of humanity. We're talking about uh, whether or not you can program a computer to find tumors in breast scans or whether or not you can, you can use nanotechnology as a way to, to treat diseases. You know, the idea that in 10 or 20 years, I'll be able to just swallow a bunch of nanobots and they'll find the things that are wrong with me and repair them. If you take the steps to understand how you go from nanotechnology today to what we think is in the future, it, it dispels a lot of the myths that people have about singularities. There, there was a very good mixture of optimists and, and pessimists in the context of the course. So people who didn't think that the emergence of, a, of an AI would, would be good and, and that argued that it would be bad. But uh, overall, the idea behind it right, is, is to foster discussion. So it was really good having those viewpoints because it allows you to hone, hone the edges of your own thoughts. There were, there were many different perspectives of people in the course. So students that were sitting in the course had different thoughts on whether AI would, would have a good outcome for humanity or a bad outcome, or whether becoming more cybernetic and having more technological improvements of our bodies was a good thing or a bad thing. And there was a lot of discussion centered around the ethics of even development of new medicines, right? And using, using computers to, to decide how how new, new medicines should be, should be delivered and should be manufactured. But I think ultimately having that balance of optimists and pessimists in the course was a, a way for me to hone my own thoughts. It was a way for me to, to look at my thoughts in a mirror and say, well, this is what I think, but at the same time, these are the things within my train of thought that, that other people find fault in. And what are the reasons that they find those faults, right? It's, ha it's, it's really valuable having that feedback. Because in a normal lecture, you have a professor standing at the front, and you've got students sitting in the audience. And more often than not, they're just copying down notes. And there's no room for discussion. 
and that's how a lot of sciences work, right? That's how a lot of engineering courses work, that you're there to learn a particular thing, but that is the be all and the end all of that particular thing. And in this course, it was more, more towards uh, really developing my own thoughts on whether or not I think that these medical singularities and these technological th singularities are good things. One lecture that I think I liked the most was the Dean of Arts, Les Leslie Cormack's lecture entitled The Elixir of Life and uh, Magic and Technology from the Renaissance to Harry Potter. And that course was the most contentious for me because as a, as a scientist, I'm not, I'm not trained to think about things historically. I'm not trained to think about them creatively. And even though creativity comes into play when, we, when I do science, the, the point of view that, that I got from Dr. Cormack was that we can't think of these historical events, the you know, shamanism and using medicine in a, in a magical way. Those are important historically, right? They, and this was a brand new thought for me. This is something that I hadn't considered before, but that in the context of the 1500s and the 1600s, that the medical treatments that they had were, the, the, were effective in, in the context of the 1500s and 1600s. They may not have known what cancer was or, or what depression was, but characterizing it as a demon that had to be excised and using uh, available herbal remedies or available treatments, though that was medicine. And so I, I really got a different perspective on, on technology in the sense that technology isn't just putting together atoms in new configurations and having it do something for you. Technology is examining nature around you and trying to find out why particular things work. It's not necessarily building thing, things that's, that, that work. It's, it's looking around and, and finding solutions that already exist that you haven't seen before or heard about before. Earl Waugh gave a, a series of lectures on medical ethics and the human commitment to progress and what that means to us as humans. And I think for me, that just showed me that there's another side of this, that progress for progress's sake isn't enough, that you can't just say, you know, why did I climb Everest? Well, because it was there, or we choose to go to the moon, not because it's easy, but because it's hard. And those are great motivations, but there's another side of those statements that needs to be evaluated. You know, why are we developing better medicine? Why are we trying to extend the human lifespan? And there are no straight answers. And that's, I think, uh, it's probably, that's probably the most valuable thing to learn from these. But that everybody makes up their own, or everybody comes up with their own answer. And you can listen to someone like Earl Waugh, and even if you disagree with what he has to say, you get some value from, from listening to his perspective. So one, one part of the course that, uh, that I didn't expect was all these visiting speakers. And they called in on Skype and sometimes on their iPhone. And we talked about a, a variety of different subjects. So we talked with uh, Marcus Hutter about whether or not intelligence can explode, whether or not the track that we're on in terms of artificial intelligence is headed towards a singularity. And uh, it was having lecturers come in on Skype and, and basically give a lecture, that was a, a completely new and exciting experience because you can watch, you know, oftentimes the people that were tele, or oftentimes the presenters who came on Skype are people that, you know, it would be impossible to bring them in. It would be extremely costly. But because their time commitment is one or two hours and because they've already prepared the lecture, they can come in and after their lecture has been given, answer questions that we have about it and really get in touch with us through, through these new technologies. So I thought that was a fascinating way of presenting information. And I think my favorite lecture was the lecture by James Hughes. And he talked a lot about immunity to growing automation. So his concern was that in the future, all these new technologies that are emerging today are gonna replace the utility that a single human being has. And I, I think his lesson, it could be summarized in, in four words, and he said it right at the end of his lecture, but uh, it, it left a really lasting impression on me. And he, he said, 
be smart and be healthy, or keep learning and, and stay fit. And I think that that's, a, that's, that's probably the most important lesson that I learned from the entire course, because we're, we're talking about extending lifespans well beyond 100 years by the time I'm 100 years old. And someone needs to, to tell us today that if we want to be relevant in the future, we need to, to keep learning and we need to stay healthy. And we'll, we'll find that as time progresses, as more and more people start adopting technology, that this is certainly true. Because anybody now can pick up an iPad and, and go online and, and learn new material. Anybody can go to Code Academy and start programming today. But if we don't consider those options ourselves, then we're going to be left behind.